This is the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast, presented by Massage Envy, the first podcast devoted entirely to Arkansas baseball. Featuring insight from Arkansas baseball color analyst Bubba Carpenter. Here's Matt Jones. It's game week. Arkansas and Illinois State will play three times this weekend at Baumwalker Stadium. First game Friday at 3 o'clock. Teams will also play Saturday at noon and Sunday at 1 o'clock. All three games will be streamed on SEC Network Plus. Matt Jones with Arkansas baseball color analyst Bubba Carpenter will be joined a little later today by Joe Healy of Baseball America, who will give us a preview of Illinois State as well as Arkansas's other opponents during the non-conference season. Bubby, you and I were out at the ballpark last Sunday. We watched a real high-scoring scrimmage, close to 30 runs scored in six innings. What were your biggest takeaways from watching the Razorbacks' final scrimmage of the preseason? I tell you what, Matt, it was a freaking laser show is what it was. If you like offense, you got to see a whole lot of offense. There were some hard-hit balls. Well, you know, both sides of the field, but, you know, really from the projected, you know, starting lineup, I mean, there were there were hard hit balls and some really good at bats. That's the thing that really stood out for me. Um, it's just the way our hitters controlled the, the, the at bats, you know, up and down the lineup. I didn't see them swinging a lot of bad pitches. I saw them take breaking balls out of the zone, get fastballs in the book zone and hammer them. Uh, when there was a breaking ball left up, they crushed it. And it just, it didn't seem like we missed a lot of pitches that we should have hit. Uh, and we didn't chase a lot of pitches out of the zone. And that's what good offensive teams do. And so, you know, usually early on, you know, the pitching's a little bit ahead of the hitting. But I tell you, they looked, uh, the lineup looked really good on, on Sunday. It was good to see. They don't have official stats during scrimmages. So we have to keep stats on our own. So these are unofficial. But I had, what's basically the starting lineup and, and it's not, com- it's, it's not the total starting lineup. So like for instance, uh, Dylan Leach, who I think is going to be a backup to Michael Turner was playing catcher for uh, the, the lineup that had mostly starters in it. Uh, Zach Gregory was playing in center field. We'll talk a little bit later about uh, Gregory and Webb. It seems like, you know, there might be a little bit of a competition there for time in center field between them, but that, that starting lineup, basically uh, I had them for 21 runs in six innings uh, Caden Wallace just continues to hit really well. Uh, Robert Moore had a real big day. Dylan Leach was someone who I was really impressed with. I think he went three for five with four RBI, uh, had a couple of two-run hits during the scrimmage. Uh, the, the question naturally becomes Bubba, and this, you know we see this a lot of times like during football when they're, they're scrimmaging in the spring or in the preseason, it's, is the defense ahead of the offense? Well, in, in baseball, is it a, is it a sign that this is just a really good lineup? Are, are there pitching concerns? What do you see right now from the team? Well, you know, I saw, I saw a few wild pitches, you know, there were a few you know, hit batters. I was getting, at one point I was getting a little bit concerned that someone was going to take one in the head or in the, in the hand, you know, before opening weekend. But, uh, you know, th- the pitchers weren't hitting their spots like we'd like to see, but you know, I think a lot of it, Matt, is just good hitting. I really do. I, you know, I actually texted Nate Thompson afterwards and, and made a comment to him about, wow, you know, that was impressive, you know, just, just the way they swung the bat. And it's, for me, it's not, I, I define a good hitter, by what he doesn't swing at, you know, that's what separates the good hitters from the bad. And, and we didn't chase pitches out of the zone. I mean, we really stayed in the zone, you know, uh, Brady Tigert started out uh, pitching against the starting lineup. And, you know, from my vantage point, he's got really good stuff, a good fastball. He's got a nasty slider. Um, and they they approached him great. And, you know, I don't I don't think Brady, I believe he just got, I think he went two-thirds of an inning, uh, gave up, what, seven runs. I don't have the stats here in front of me, but their approach against him was incredible. And now I get it, he's a freshman. But you know he's a freshman with really good stuff, and and boy they just they just they just used him out there on the mound, and uh, that's what good hitting teams do. And so you know I think it's really a, a you know I think it's our lineup, just how good they are, and not so much as the pitchers being you know a little shaky. Now it was cold out, you know when it's cold, you know you do lose your grip a little bit um, on the fastballs. You can see some fastballs sailing up and in. Uh, but you know, it was just good, good, good approach, uh, good discipline up and down the lineup. 
you mentioned Tiger. Uh, I had him for seven runs and two-third of an inning, but only two of those runs were earned. And, you know, one of the things that stood out to me about the lineup is that there were two big innings on Sunday. There was a seven-run first inning, and there was a nine-run fifth inning. And I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think 11 of those runs in those two innings were unearned. But I think what it goes to show you is something that Dave Van Horn said a few weeks ago, right before preseason practice started, was, you know, you can't give this lineup an inch or they're really going to make you pay. And the, the ability to score after, you know, the teams have given them an opportunity, like you said, the ability to take walks. I was really impressed with some of the two strike, two out hitting that I saw from uh, the team, like, for instance, Caden Wallace, uh, his three-run home run in the fifth inning of the scrimmage on Sunday, it came with two strikes and two outs. I think those are all really good indicators of a, of a pretty good lineup, Bubba. I think so. And, you know, there were some other at-bats that stood out. One that stood out for me, Matt, was was Peyton Stovall. Uh, what was it, an 11-pitch at-bat? 11 like pitches. Heston Toll. Yep. And Heston, to me, Heston Toll looked like he had really good stuff. Um uh, I've liked him. Uh, I, I think he's going to be, I think he's going to contribute this year. Uh, but, but Peyton for a freshman to have that type of a bat and he was fouling off tough pitches down and away up and in, he was hitting line drives down the left field line, the right field line battled him, you know, with, with two strikes and uh, so 11 pitches ended up getting a base hit to drive in a run. And so those type of at bats are really encouraging. And, you know, you mentioned Caden Wallace. Uh, he just looks locked in. I mean, you see him take, taking pitches. And like I said, you know, I, I watch guys, how they take a pitch says how they feel at the plate. And, boy, he takes pitches. He'll take sliders off that outside corner like he knew they were coming. I mean, there's no flinch. It's just calm, easy. And, uh, you know, it's, it's impressive to see that early on. Stovall told me that during that 11 pitch at bat, there were seven two strike pitches that he faced. And so he was fouling off a lot of, of two strike pitches until he finally you know, got one that he could hammer up the middle. Uh, you mentioned Wallace. I think my biggest takeaway from the preseason Bubba has been how well he has hit. Uh, even before preseason practice started, you know, all these preseason All America teams were coming out and he wasn't on any of them. And I tweeted something about a month ago. I said, I think the, the people who are voting on these are really sleeping on Caden Wallace. And that was really based on the numbers that he had last year at Cape Cod, uh, what I saw him do during the fall. Some of it's a little bit based on reputation. I mean, everybody thinks that this is going to be a really good hitter. But, man, what he's done during the preseason, uh, we've seen him in four open scrimmages, okay? These are his numbers, seven for ten, three home runs, two doubles, five walks, six runs batted in, eight runs scored. That's incredible. It doesn't matter what level you're playing against. Those are incredible numbers. Sounds like an All-American to me. Well, I don't know about you, but uh, – <laughs> and I did read your tweets, and I agree. I think he was overlooked, kind of snubbed a little bit in some of those. But, you know, sometimes a guy, you know, when something like that happens, has a little chip on his shoulder, something to prove. But I don't think that's Caden Wallace. I think he's just a hitter. He was born a hitter. He's hit his whole life. And I t tell you what, when he steps up to the plate, he's a force to be reckoned with. And it's I, I expect him to have a, a huge year this year. And I think him moving back to third base, that's his natural position, I think it's going to take a little bit of pressure off of him also. And, you know, a lot of people are just the opposite. Like, well, when a guy moves from infield, there's way more pressure in the infield. He's got to go out to the outfield. He can relax a little bit, focus more on 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 his at bats but I think with Kate moving back I think he's going to be comfortable at third base I expect him to have a huge year this year you know what it reminds me of it reminds me of watching Heston Kerstad hit before the 2020 season you, I'm sure you went out to some of those scrimmages too they couldn't get him out and then the season starts and he gets off to this great start and that's really one of those great what might have been said the 2020 season not shut down Arkansas may have had two straight golden spikes winners because I think he was on pace to have that kind of year in 2020 Oh, you're right. I mean, he was, I, and I did go out and watch and he was absolutely locked in, just hitting rockets all over the field. And so, you know, it's still, you look back at that 2020 year, like, wow, what, what could have been, but you know, you see a lot of similarities in, in Caden. And, and, and the thing about this lineup is there's, you can't pitch around Caden, you know, because right. right now he's got Borfin behind him and you know, that could change, you know, it could be, who knows who could be, there's a lot of guys that could step into that three hole. But if, if Caden Wallace stays in the two hole, you can't pitch around him. I mean, you've got to, 
you know, you got to pitch to these guys. And the thing about Caden is he's not going to chase a lot of pitches out of the zone. And that's what makes him a special hitter. He's a, he's a guy that doesn't swing at a lot of bad pitches, but he's got power. He can hit the off fields with power. And, uh, and so he's a special player. And he's got Peyton still wall hitting in front of him. I think one of the, you know, we'll talk a little bit about what we expect to see this weekend in a, in a minute, but I think one of the things that's probably pretty safe to say, at least on opening day, is that the one, two, three in the order are going to be Peyton Stovall one, Caden Wallace two, uh, Jace Borfin three, and that's been a really, really productive uh, part of the lineup for them. You're right. Those, those three – uh, is as, as good as any three in the country. Now, I know we're talking about Peyton Stovall. He's a, he's a freshman, but just watching his advanced approach at the plate, he does not look like a freshman up there. And I think he's going to do a great job in that leadoff role if that's where he stays. And, uh, you know, it's kind of setting the table for this offense. I mentioned Wallace, uh, a couple of notes here. He and Robert Moore were named to the preseason Golden Spikes Award watch list uh, earlier this week. Uh, there are 55 players on the preseason Golden Spikes list, uh, including a lot from the SEC. Also, Illinois State has announced its pitching rotation for this weekend. The Redbirds are going to start on Friday a right-hander, Jordan Lucier. He was 6-3 and three with a 4.36 ERA a year ago. On Saturday, they'll start left-hander Sean Sinisco, 5-5 five and five with a 4-4 ERA last year. And on Sunday, they're going to throw Derek Salata. This is a right-hander who was their closer last season. He had six saves and a 4.95 ERA. It'll be the first time that he has started a game in his college career. Arkansas is not going to name its starting rotation until Thursday. But, but by all indications, though, you can, you can really kind of see what a team's planning from a pitching standpoint by – you know, how they're throwing pitchers, when they're throwing them. And I would be really surprised if we didn't see Connor Nolan on Friday, probably Hagen Smith on Saturday, and probably Jackson Wiggins on Sunday. I think you're right, Matt, but, you know, I guess we have to wait till tomorrow to find out. I know, uh, I know I, I listened to an interview with Matt Hobbs yesterday. They tried to, they tried to squeeze it out of him, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't give it up. But, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of guys they're looking at, but I, I think right now going into opening weekend, that's going to be the, the three that they go with. Uh, but, you know, we could be wrong in that, but they do have a lot of options, but the way the, the scrimmages have been lining up, it looks like that's, that's what they're going to start with. And, you know, I like it. I, I like those three. I think that's a good, it's a good mix, you know, three different style, pitchers going out there three different angles of the ball coming into the plate um just three totally different pitchers so i think that's a good combination connor nolan last friday when he pitched he went four and two third innings pretty good decently long outing for for nolan uh, i think typically on opening weekend i think they try to keep their pitchers in the 65 70 pitch range and so it seems like uh, he's going to be there uh, four and two third innings. He gave up uh, two home runs to Braden Webb and Chris Lanzilli. And the Webb home run was just an absolute no doubter that Webb is showing great power. He also hit a home run against Jackson Wiggins last Sunday to lead off that scrimmage. Uh, we didn't get to see the scrimmage last Saturday because of the weather. They were inside. Uh, all indications are Hagen Smith has been really good in their scrimmages and was good again last weekend. I was talking to Peyton Stovall about him. Uh, after Sunday's scrimmage, he said that he thinks that Hagen Smith, when the 2024 draft rolls around, could be a top five overall pick. The praise, Bubba, and, and you've heard this too, for Smith out of the coaches, out of the players, it's been really high uh, for a freshman pitcher. I don't know that I can remember a freshman getting this type of buzz uh, before he ever stepped on the mound in a game. I don't think so. And, and I said it last week, Matt. When I want to know about a pitcher, I, I talk to the hitters that have faced him, and I like to talk to the catcher that catches him. And, and you're right. There's been so much praise about him, not just his stuff. I mean, we've got a lot of guys with good stuff, but he knows how to use that stuff to get outs. And he doesn't – a freshman, he's, he's advanced. When he steps out there on the mound, he, he doesn't act like a freshman, doesn't pitch like a freshman, and he's got three-plus pitches. So – so he's he's definitely going to be good, and I think you know you follow him up. He's a totally different look than Connor Nolan. Connor Nolan's a fastball slider guy or fastball cutter guy now, um, from the right side. Then you've got you got Hagen Smith on Saturday. If he is our Saturday guy, kind of a, a low arm slot lefty with power, 92, 95 guy with with a really good changeup and a good slider. 
And then, you know, if, if, if Jackson Wiggins ends up being our Sunday guy, you know, he's a big power, tall power guy over the top, a totally different, you know, look, the ball coming into the zone, more of a, you know, more of a downward angle, the ball coming down into the zone. Uh, and Jackson made some really good pitches on Sunday. Now he wasn't really sharp, but I really attribute that. And, you know, I don't like excuses, but when you're a guy like him, you know, the ball, it's tough to get a grip. You and I talked about it at the scrimmage on Sunday. It's tough to get a grip on the ball when it's cold like that. It was a North wind, um, not a good day to pitch. And I think that had something to do with, but Jackson still threw some really good breaking balls. Um, so I think that's, that's going to make him a good pitcher, but I really do like the, the different style pitchers that hopefully we're going to run out there on, on, on this weekend. And Wiggins on Sunday, we had him unofficially three and two third innings, six hits, uh, three runs, all were earned, three strikeouts. He hit three batters and he threw a wild pitch, which kind of speaks to what you're talking about. Some, some problems, grip of the ball potentially. And it wasn't just him. It was, it was all the pitchers. I think there were six batters who were hit Sunday. Uh, there were a couple of times where you kind of held your breath when you saw somebody get hit, Chris Lenzilli got hit in his hand. Uh, Robert Moore took one off the ankle. We, we even saw Gabe Starks. I want to get your, your thoughts on Gabe Starks because you saw him pitch on Sunday too. Uh, you know, another guy who's very similar, I think, to Jackson Wiggins, you know, in, in the power, the types of pitches that they throw. Uh, he gave up a couple of runs, walked a couple of batters, but he did strike out three. Um, chances are that he's going to be their closer, at least to start the season, or a closer. I don't know that they're going to have just one closer. Uh, what, what did you think watching Gabe? I thought he looked good. You know, he walked a couple, uh, left some pitches up in the zone, was was up with his fastball. But, you know, one of the at-bats that really stood out was against Stovall. You know, he was he was one of the – Stovall didn't take a lot of bad swings, but uh, it didn't look fooled a whole lot throughout the day. I think he was four for six on the day. But um, uh, Gabe threw him a really good breaking ball that struck him out, and uh, he, looked, he looked fooled on that pitch. I don't know if you talked to him about it afterwards, but – you and I were trying to figure out what that pitch was, and uh, it ended up being it was a breaking ball, but it, it was a good one. So, you know, even though he walked a couple guys, he, he, he still he struck out the side and, and, and looked good doing it. I listened to that interview that you were talking about with Matt Hobbs yesterday on Phil Elson's show. Kind of a, a, an interesting quote, I thought, that came from that. He said, I know there are a lot of question marks about our pitching staff, but if you're patient, I think you'll like the product. It seems to me like there's just a lot of unknowns about this pitching staff right now. But like you said, there are a lot of pieces. I almost feel, Bubba, there are more pieces to this pitching staff, even with Peyton Paulette out this year, than I ever felt like there were in 2021. I think so. I mean, you look at all the – just there's so many possibilities. Um, you know, you look at Evan Taylor. I loved Evan Taylor. You know, they've dropped him down kind of a sidearm delivery – and as a left-handed batter, I went and stood behind home plate when he was pitching. Now, he hit Zach Gregory. He ran a, a two-strike fastball in on Zach Gregory, hit him in the ribs. And that was one of them I was kind of cringing on. That looked like it hurt. Um, but, boy, his slider's nasty from down there. His stuff looks really good from down there, especially if you're looking for a guy to come out of pin late in the game and, and, and get a lefty out, kind of a specialty guy. Um, don't know how that will be effective against righties, but against lefties, that's a tough look. Um, you know, Zach Morris looked good. There's just – there's a whole lot of weapons that they can go to. Um, and you and I didn't get to see all of them on, on Sunday, but but they've just got a whole lot of options. And I, I think it's a it's it's like like Hobbs said. It's a – I think the finished product everyone's going to be happy with. And, and I think things are going to change from this weekend, you know, going in every weekend. I think it will evolve a little bit, and guys will kind of settle into their roles. And whoever goes out there and gets, gets the job done is going to keep getting innings. Well, and, and like Matt Hobbs pointed out, you know, it wasn't until the Auburn series last year that they knew what Kevin Copps was. It, it took them seven, eight weeks into the season before they realized that they've got, you know, this incredible weapon at the back end of their bullpen. And so I think you got to be patient the first four or five weeks as they're trying to figure out what roles are. What pitchers do during scrimmages, that's not always going to translate to what they do during a game. It's, it's, it's a totally different thing, Bubba. You can speak to this when the lights come on. It, it, it's totally different than what happens in scrimmages. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I think that it, it favors the hitters because they've seen these guys a lot. You know, we're, we're going on and on about the hitters, and I don't think we're giving the pitchers enough credit. Look, when you see a pitch – after you see a pitcher a couple of times, like if I see his fastball, if I see his changeup, if I see his breaking ball, well, I follow it away. And as a hitter, you follow those things away. And once you see it, you, you, 
and you see it again, you're going to hit it. And, you know, these guys have been facing these guys a long time. And so they know everything that they throw. Um, so I think the hitters have the advantage there. Now we're still really good hitters, but I, I just, I do, I think that gives the hitters the advantage knowing what's coming. And, you know, you go back to Gabe Starks, you know, he did give up a couple of runs, um, you know, but as Phil liked to say, he struck out the side. I, I don't, I don't call it striking out the side. If you, if you walk to, you give up a hit, um, you give up two runs, but then you have three strikeouts in the inning. I'm, for me, striking out the side is three strikeouts, three One, and two, three, three down. But yep. yeah, but I don't know where you lie on that. But I'm kind of with Phil Ellison and I. We argue about that all the time. But but he did make some really good pitches, and I think that's what you have to take from it. I, I, well, Will McIntyre came in. He fell behind Michael Turner three and zero, oh, and then threw him three cutters, mm -hmm. and they were dirty cutters. I mean, they were you know I, should I say this cops like, but they were really nasty and and struck Michael out on three straight cutters and so you I take the positives away from it you can sit there and look at all the negatives all day and playing a game of baseball you know well you know he fell behind 3-0 well so what he came back and made three huge pitches when he needed to and and you know that's that's the way I view it and I think that's the you know Hobbs and 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 uh and uh, DVH, I think they look at it the same way like wow he made some really good pitches here when he had to and that, and that's the key with that in mind that the hitters know these pitchers so well. Uh, one pitcher who I've been really kind of interested to watch this preseason uh, is Cole Ramage, and he's been here for a long time. These hitters have, have seen everything Cole Ramage has to offer them. But in the times that I've watched him, Bubba, uh, I believe that he's thrown four scoreless innings this preseason. Now, that's in the open scrimmages. Something may have happened behind closed doors that we don't know about. But in the open scrimmages, four innings scoreless against a really good lineup – uh, what do you think that says about Cole Ramage and, and what they might have in him this year? Because he's such an interesting pitcher. He pitched really meaningful innings as a freshman. I mean, he was pitching at the College World Series, maybe even pitched against Oregon State in the championship series. And he seems like he's kind of fallen back a little bit the last couple of years. Uh, what do you think it says about him that he's pitching so well this preseason? Well, I'm happy. And, and for people that have listened to me talk for years, I've, I've always been a Cole Ramage fan. Um, I think he's going to have a good year right here. I think he's one of those veteran guys that we really need to step up. And, you know, you mentioned Oregon State, and we talked about it a little bit last week on, on the podcast, is he came in against Oregon State and made some huge pitches, and, and he, he throws that change up. And, and, and like I said, I call it a Bugs Bunny change up. It's just nasty. Now, he, he hasn't had a lot to go with that in the past, or his other pitches to go with that haven't been as, as effective. Um, but I think it's helped him a lot. You know, him and him and Kevin Cops are good friends. I think watching Kevin go about his business, I think it's helped him a lot. And so I think he's a guy that's going to step up big for us. He might be one of those surprises down there in the bullpen because we do need some of our veteran guys to step up and get it done. And, and Cole's got the makeup. He doesn't get rattled when he gets out there on the mound. You know what you're going to get out of him. So I, I'm, I hope he I hope he figures it out this year because he could be a big piece of the bullpen down there. It seems like with a pitcher like him, you know, he, he's not one of the ones that wows you with velocity, uh, almost like a Connor Nolan, uh, even though I think Nolan's velocity has gotten better this season. Uh, it seems with them, it's so much about Pitt's placement and, you know, they're pitching to contact. And if they're really on, it can it can be a really good thing for a, a pitching staff because they're going to be able to buy you a lot of innings. They're going to have quick innings and and be able to be recycled quite a bit. Oh, you, you know, the thing is, Matt, we fall in love with the radar gun and I'm guilty of it. I'm not going to lie. When I look up on the school board and I see a red number, I always say something about it on the air. But you know what I like more than red numbers is outs. And I think Hobbs is the same way. We don't care if a guy's throwing, you know, 88 or 98, you know, as long as he's getting outs, I'm happy. Now, as a hitter, I'd rather face 98 down the middle than 88 cutting or sinking. And that's a whole lot harder to hit when you start moving that ball around. And, 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 and Cole's a guy that knows how to move that ball around, and he doesn't get all the accolades that some of these other guys throwing mid-90s get. But you know what? If he can get outs, he's going to get innings, and that's the key. The Whole Hog Baseball Podcast is sponsored by Massage Envy, voted the best day spa and best massage in all of Northwest Arkansas. Visit Mike and his staff in Tuscany Square at 2603 West Pleasant Grove Road in Rogers, or in Fayetteville at 3557 North Shiloh Drive. Massage Envy has services for everyone. MassageEnvy.com. Massage Envy with clinics in Rogers and Fayetteville has been awarded Northwest Arkansas's best day spa and best massage. One of the reasons is our care for athletes, 
both serious and recreational. We now offer rapid tension relief sessions using a high caliber vibrating tool and total body stretch sessions like the ones used by the PGA. Both of these new services can be combined with the always popular deep muscle treatment. So whether you compete or just want to relax, there is no place better than Massage Envy. Wholehogsports.com has the largest, most experienced staff of reporters covering sports in Arkansas. Football, basketball, baseball, recruiting, and more. You'll find it at wholehogsports.com. The website includes up-to-minute news, daily commentaries, and award-winning photography from the staffs of Hogs Illustrated and the Democrat Gazette. For subscriptions, call 1-800-757-6277. That's 1-800-757-6277. Or visit us online today. Whole Hog Sports. Dot com. You know it never goes out of style? A great burger. And for a long time now, the best burgers around have been made at CJ's Butcher Boy. I've been stopping at their Russellville location for years to enjoy a double with bacon, cheese, and all the fixings. Well, the fries are always made fresh, and their shakes are made with real premium ice cream. And now that CJ's Butcher Boy has a Fayetteville location, too, on Weddington, you can bet I'll be there a lot more. CJ's Butcher Boy in Russellville and Fayetteville. When all you do are burgers, they have to be the best. Welcome back to the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast. Now let's look at this week in the SEC, presented by CJ's Butcher Boy Burgers. Quick look at games to watch this weekend around the SEC. Auburn is at the College Baseball Showdown. The Tigers will play Oklahoma, Texas Tech, and Kansas State for the Big 12 over three days at Globe Life Field. Of course, Arkansas played in the inaugural event there last year, and Dave Van Horn says the Razorbacks are going to go back to Arlington next year and again in 2024. A couple of big non-conference series this weekend. Vanderbilt and Mississippi State will be hosting. Vanderbilt hosting Oklahoma State in Nashville. Vanderbilt's ranked second, and Oklahoma State is eighth in the preseason coaches poll. That's the only top ten matchup on opening weekend in college baseball. In Starkville, Mississippi State ranked third will host Long Beach State. The Dirtbags, they're ranked in some polls, but they're just outside the top 25 in the coaches. Other series this week, Albany is at Georgia, Xavier is at Alabama, Kentucky goes on the road to Jacksonville State, UNC Greensboro is at South Carolina, Tennessee hosts Georgia Southern, Charleston Southern is at Ole Miss, Liberty at Florida, Missouri on the road at Nichols, Maine is at LSU, Paul Maneri, the former Tiger coach, will throw out the first pitch in the season opener of that one, and Fordham is at Texas A&M. A&M and LSU, by the way, those will be the first games for their new coaches, Jay Johnson at LSU and Jim Schlossnagel at A&M. Johnson is at LSU after two College World Series appearances with Arizona. Schlossnagel went to Omaha five times with TCU. SEC teams in the rankings this week, we mentioned Vanderbilt's number two, Mississippi State's three, Arkansas four, Ole Miss number six, LSU number seven, Florida rounds out the top ten, Tennessee is ranked 16th, and Georgia is 17th, and Bubba, not an SEC team yet, but te- Texas is the consensus number one this preseason, and the Longhorns will be in the SEC by 2026. CJ's Butcher Boy Burgers are the best in two towns. You can visit the original at 2803 North Arkansas Avenue in Russellville, or the newest location at 3484 West Weddington Drive in Fayetteville, just minutes from the ballpark. Skip the line and order online or download the app in your app store, CJ's Butcher Boy Burgers. When all you do are burgers, they have to be the best. And now, Bubba, I'm hungry, and I want a hamburger. Hey, that sounds good, doesn't it? It does. We uh, mentioned SEC, and the SEC preseason predictions came out last week. Arkansas is picked to win the West, and a little bit of an oddity, Ole Miss is picked to win the conference, and we'll talk about how that happens here in just a second. Vanderbilt is picked to win the East. Uh, Arkansas had three players on the preseason All-SEC team, including Robert Moore and Caden Wallace. Brady Slavens was an outfielder on the second team. How do you see the SEC playing out this year, Bubba? Because if you look at the preseason poll, just mentioned you've got six teams in the top ten. Tennessee and Georgia are ranked. You've got a number of other teams like Auburn that are just outside the coaches' top 25. Every year, it feels like it's just a war in the SEC baseball, and I think this year might be the most competitive that we've seen yet. I I think it's the best year of college baseball you're going to see. There's so much talent, and I think I said the same thing last year, but uh, I'm going to say it. I think it's even going to be better this year. There's so much talent, and I think it goes back to the – 
you know, the transfer portal, you know, fewer, fewer rounds in a major league draft. There's just a lot of things that, and not to mention just people want to play in SEC. Look at the crowds they get all over the SEC. Um, that's unmatched across, across college baseball and, and people want to be here. You know, the, the best players want to play in the, in the SEC. And so, you know, there's a whole lot of talent out there. It's, it's, uh, it's definitely going to be tough. Uh, it's the gauntlet out there when you get into SEC play, but you know, we're built for that. And uh, you know, I think, uh, I think we're going to be in good shape. Well, you know, what I think speaks to that is the fact we mentioned Sloss Nagel and Johnson came to the SEC after taking their previous team to multiple college world series. I mean, Sloss Nagel took TCU there five times. This is, you know, I mean, he was considered, one of the premier coaches at one of the premier programs. And then you look at Jacob Berry going over to LSU this year. This was the national freshman of the year last year. He's following his head coach to LSU to a completely different program. That's, I, I can't remember that there have been a lot of instances of something like that happening. No, you don't see that much, but uh, you know, it just goes to show you, you know, back to what I said, I mean, people want to be around the sec. I mean, I think we're the envy of college baseball and you look every year, you know, we're represented in the college world series and we're in the, you know, this year, six teams in the, in the top 10. And I mean, it's just, you know, the, the hard thing is, is when, once we get into sec play, we're constantly knocking each other off. And, uh, but I tell you what, it makes the guys better. It, uh, it makes the players better, you know, and it gets them more prepared to play major league baseball down the road. Okay, so we mentioned Arkansas is picked to win the West and Ole Miss is picked to win the conference. I got a lot of people ask me, how on earth does that happen? Well, here's what happens. The coaches are asked to predict the division winners. And then in a separate poll, they are asked to pick the conference winners. And what happened was that there were five coaches who picked Arkansas to win the SEC West. There were four coaches who picked Ole Miss to win the SEC West. When they asked them to pick the conference winner, all four of the coaches who picked Ole Miss – to win the West, also picked them to win the conference, whereas some of the coaches who picked Arkansas to win the West were split and picked a, a different team like Vanderbilt or Florida to win the overall conference crown. So that's how that goes. But, Bubba, this plays into, you know, one of the things we like to talk to you about, Ole Miss. Uh, just to, th this Arkansas-Ole Miss rivalry is so much fun, I think, right now. Uh, you know, a lot of people – about seven, eight years ago, tried to say it's Arkansas and Missouri State. And you know, they played in that heated super regional. They played in the regional here, the 3 a.m. game. And, and Missouri State dogpile on Arkansas's field. That was a, a good little rivalry. But the non-conference games, they don't mean nearly what the conference games mean. And uh, when you look at what Arkansas and Ole Miss have done in the regular season the last few years, you add in that super regional that they had here a few years ago. Uh, this is really, to, to me, and I know Mississippi State and LSU are big series, but to me it's the Ole Miss series that I think people look forward to the most now. I, I think so, and I think a lot of it is just the, the style of baseball that they play at Ole Miss. And, you know, I'm not afraid to say, in my opinion, a lot of it's Bush leagues. A lot of their antics they do on the field, you know, it's just not, uh, you know, hey, play with energy, play with passion, uh, have fun, but don't show up your opponent. And they do a lot of stuff that borderlines on Bush League where they're they're showing up the opponent. And and I think that fuels a fire. I think in order to have a really good rivalry, you've got to hate the other team. And, you know, back in the day, I hated Texas. I absolutely hated Texas. And uh, I wanted to beat them. <laughs> I, I always put that date on there. And I knew when we were going to play University of Texas, I wanted to beat them. It still goes that to to today and I think that's how Ole Miss is now you know do the players view it the same as you know I, I think so I think it and the other thing is they're a great team I mean they really are I mean you look at offensively Matt um, we've bragged a lot about the Razorbacks offense that I mean Ole Miss is right there with them I mean that could be one of the best offenses in college baseball if not the best if you look at the numbers they're probably the best in college baseball um, now I think when it's all said and done we're going to be better than them but, I mean, they have a really potent lineup from top to bottom. Uh, they're athletic. They're strong up the middle. Uh, they got a catcher that's a future top pick in the draft. They got a shortstop that's one of the, the best players in the, in the country probably. Um, they're really good. They got a center fielder that's a great athlete. Um, so, I mean, they're, they're like we are. They're really strong up the middle. Uh, now, pitching wise, you know, I think we're similar in a lot that they're looking to replace. They're looking for their starting rotation. I don't think they have a starting rotation right now. They lost uh, Casey. They lost, lost Hoagland. Um, so I think our teams are very similar right now, trying to put all the pieces together. But, uh, 
you know, it, it is a good rivalry. It's a fun rivalry. And I tell you what, I really look forward to them coming here to, to ball marker this year. And uh, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll put a beat down on them. Uh, you and I were both listening to Steve Holm, the Illinois State coach, uh, talk earlier today. And you, you mentioned how you think Ole Miss kind of shows the, the opponents up. I thought it was kind of interesting whenever you heard him talk about Arkansas and his impressions of Arkansas. And the first thing he said was he loves how they play the game, how he doesn't feel like they're trying to show their opponents up. I thought that was uh, high praise for the Razorback program. I think so. And that's why teams want to come here and play. It's, I, I like it. You mentioned that, Matt, because I actually wrote that down and put two stars next to it because I really want I wanted to touch on that because that's the respect that that Dave Van Horn has and around the country and and the Razorback program in itself, just as a whole. It's just the way they go out and they play the game. They're, they're, they don't play Bush League baseball. They don't show their opponent up. They don't run their mouths. They go out and they play good, hard nosed baseball. And other coaches notice that and, and they want to play teams like that. You know, and it's just the reputation that we have. I call it Razorback baseball. When we go out and we play Razorback baseball, which is just a David Van Horn, uh, Dave Van Horn style of baseball where they just go out and they play hard, uh, hard nosed baseball. They do they do the little things that other teams don't do um, and that wins ball games. You know, good baseball beats bad baseball and, and, and Razorback baseball is a good brand of baseball. You heard you say David Van Horn. You know, that's what he went by as a player when he was at Arkansas. I don't know where that came from. I've never called him David in my life. So I don't know. I'm sorry. You get me talking about Ole Miss and stuff like that. And every, I, I get a little fired up. And so there's no telling what's going to come out of my mouth. It's funny when you go back in the newspaper archives, like you look for stories about Van Horn when he was a, a player or a graduate assistant coach at Arkansas. And you type in Dave Van Horn, nothing. Type in David Van Horn, all kinds of stuff comes up. It's, it's, <laughs> I, I don't know at what point did he go from David to Dave. I don't know. We can just call him the goat. Let's just go with that because that, that, that yeah. works. Mentioned earlier, Joe Healy from Baseball America is going to be on here in a minute to talk about Illinois State. But, but I want to go back to this weekend series and, and just talk about kind of what we expect to see from Arkansas. Um, position by position, and we talked about this a little bit last week, I think it's safe to say that Michael Turner is going to be their number one catcher, but that Dylan Leach is also going to play. Peyton Stovall at first, Robert Moore at second. Uh, Jalen Battles, obviously, at short. Caden Wallace at third. The real question marks, I think, with this team come down to outfield and DH. Uh, based on what I've seen, I'd be really surprised if you don't see Borfin in left and Slavens in right. So it really comes down to what do they do at DH and what do they do in center field. We talked about this last week. Van Horn made those comments a few weeks back that Braden Webb is one of the best defensive center fielders that he's ever had. Uh, I don't know how much to read into how they have the players positioned with the different teams during the scrimmages, but they did have Braden Webb playing with what I thought was more of a, a backup lineup in the scrimmages that I saw last weekend. And they had Zach Gregory playing in center. It's, it's really interesting. What do you do with these two? Because Gregory, he's got a pretty good left-handed bat. He's got a knack for getting on base. He takes walks. He gets hit by pitches a ton. Uh, but defensively, I think Webb is, is a better defensive center fielder. I'll be interested to see what they do there this weekend. You know, it's going to be tough. I, I, you know, I would say I feel for Dave Van Horn having to make out that lineup card, but it's a fun problem to have. And, you know, you look at it, you know, he could always go with, the, you know, you can go with Zach Gregory in center and keep and keep uh, Braden Webb on the bench. You come in late, late defensive replacement. But then, you know, Braden Webb's been just crushing the ball. So, you know, I don't know if you go with lefty righty matchups there. Mm -hmm. You know, they're throwing two righties and a lefty. Um, it's the same with Lanzilli. Do you DH him against the righty or do you DH him against the the lefty or play him in left against the lefty? It's there's so many options there. But you know, Zach. He, he squared up some balls on uh, on Sunday. He looked really good at the plate, and uh, he looked good in the outfield too. He's moving real well in the outfield. So, and I know he's one of the team leaders. He's a team captain, and and they like to get that team captain out there when they can. And so mm -hmm. it's, boy, I feel for Dave, you know, having to make that decision. It's it's a tough one, but I think either way he goes, he's going to be in good shape. It seems to me like that center field position at DH that there's three players that are going to fill those two positions and, and you're going to have one sitting on the bench uh, every game or at least starting out the games. It, it seems to me like it's going to be Braden Webb, Zach Gregory, Chris Lanzilli, some combination of those three in those two positions, uh, because I was really impressed with how Lanzilli hit this weekend. I actually, made, I made a, a comment to somebody uh, before he made, before he hit his home run off of uh, Nolan 
on Friday, I said, he hasn't hit quite like I thought he would. Next pitch, home run, and then he just hit all weekend. And it seems like they're starting to get maybe at the plate what they expected from him, a, a big right-handed power bat. I think so. And even if he doesn't start – you know, that's a huge weapon to have off the bench. That's a veteran bat off the bench, but I, I, I think he's going to be in the lineup, you know, and it, it's hard to say with, you know, I think DVH has kind of changed over the years. I think the old Dave Van Horn would have gone more on the defensive side and we're, we're now, you know, Dave's, Dave's coming around. He, he likes, he likes that offensive side of it too. So, you know, but he's got a lot of different options to go with. Um, I think they're all going to end up in there and, you know, they could even, they could even put Braden Webb in center and DH Zach Gregory. Um, you know, against the righties, that puts a that puts another really good left-handed bat in the lineup, and so you know, there's just so many options, Matt. And we can sit here, we can talk about it all day. It's it's a fun conversation to have, but uh, I can't wait till Friday to see uh, when they send me that lineup, see what it looks like. I don't want to talk about predictions, wins and losses, Bubba, but I want to know what are you looking for? You know, as, as you're going to the ballpark Friday afternoon and, and you're getting ready to watch three games, what are the things that you're interested in seeing this weekend uh, from the Razorbacks? Well, I'm I'm interested to see how the pitching. Yeah, you know, this is probably not the answer you would you were expecting. I'm interested to see how the pitching shapes up. I want to see some of those new guys out on the bump and see how they do. Um, if you're asking me, you know, what do I expect? Wins and losses. Look, I, I go into every weekend wanting a sweep. I do. I'm greedy. You know, if you look on paper we're better than this team on paper. It's a good team. They got some veteran guys on there, but you know, I, I want to win. We're, we're the Razorbacks. You know, you come into our stadium, we're going to, we're going to sweep you. But what I really want to see individually is I want to see some of these, these guys step out there on the mound and see what they can do when they're not facing their own hitters. You know, I, I think we're going to score a lot of runs. I really do uh, just because that's the type of lineup we have, but I really want to see, you know, how, how some of those new arms do when they step out there on and in front of a big crowd weekend's going to be great. You know, we're going to pack that stadium in and uh, I think it's gonna be a really good test for some of these guys. I'm interested to see some of the things with the lineup. You know, we've seen them tinker. We talked about we think we know what the first three hitters in the lineup are going to be. We've seen them tinker with some of those middle positions. And a lot of these scrimmage lineups have only had eight players. So you're not you're not sure what they're going to do, say, like in the bottom five when they insert that ninth player. Uh, I'm interested to see some things with that. And to your point about pitching, not so much with the starters. I'm really interested to see – where they bring in some of these middle relief pitchers. You know, what, what kind of roles do they envision for a Zach Morris, for an Evan Taylor, for an Elijah Trest, uh, Cole Ramage, a Zebulon Vermillion, and you kind of go down the list. Uh, you know, and, and again, it, it changes a lot. But I think that it's really telling when where you see pitchers come in this time of year uh, it is a, a pretty telling thing about what the coaches kind of have, the role that they have envisioned for them. I think so. And, and the thing that we've seen out of Dave Van Horn in the past is, he worries more. This is kind of spring training to get them ready for SEC. So he he might make a move or two right now that he wouldn't make once SEC starts. You know, he might he might put a guy out there and say, you know, can he come in out of the bullpen and get this left handed this left handed hitter out? You know, he might he, he he's going to experiment. I think a little bit. And you know, what I'm interested to see is he going to is he going to pitch more of the guys or is he gonna some of those young guys is he gonna bring them into pressure situations just to see how they react to it and uh i i agree with you though matt i think that's that's going to be exciting kind of seeing how some of that shapes up and uh who, who steps up and gets it done and you hear him say a lot of times early in the season uh that he'll pull pitchers earlier than than he might otherwise and you hear him say this all the time because that might be an out that might be an inning two innings that we need later on down the road they're they're really cautious with their arms this time of year. Next is Joe Healy of Baseball America previewing Illinois State and the Razorbacks other non-conference games. This is the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast. Massage Envy has been voted the best day spa and best massage in all of Northwest Arkansas. Great therapists and estheticians go along with a new service that I am truly excited about. Rapid Tension Relief uses a special tool that will melt the tension and soreness away. Trust me, you will not be disappointed in the results. I highly recommend this feature along with a total body stretch assisted stretch program. Whether you are competing at a high level or just want to relax, these services are for everyone. Massage, Rapid Tension Relief, Total Body Stretch, 
deep muscle treatment massage, you choose. Or you can try any combination of those. So the next time you're feeling tight, make sure to call my friends at Massage Envy. Want more coverage of your home team? Download the Whole Hog Sports Video On Demand app. Check out the Fan Zone and get up-to-the-minute videos, podcasts, and features on football, basketball, baseball, recruiting, and more. Search for Whole Hog Sports on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire at home. And take it with you on the go by downloading it for your mobile device in your app store. The Whole Hog Sports Video On Demand app. Get it today. Now let's take a look at the week ahead, presented by Grease Pig. Arkansas and Illinois State play three times this weekend. The Razorbacks and Redbirds open the season Friday with a 3 o'clock game at Baumwalker Stadium. Also scheduled to play Saturday at noon and Sunday at 1 o'clock. All three games will be streamed on SEC Network Plus. Brett Dolan and Troy Eklund will be on the call. The week ahead is brought to you by the Grease Pig. For 20 years, they have specialized in serving UA students, faculty, and staff with two locations in Fayetteville on College Avenue at MLK Boulevard. The Grease Pig has experience for all your repair needs and, of course, complete service oil changes staffed with ASE certified master technicians. They also provide tires and alignment services at their location on College Avenue. The Grease Pig, it's all about taking care of you, a proud supporter of the Whole Hog Baseball podcast. We go now to Joe Healy of Baseball America. Does a great job covering college baseball for for that publication. You can catch him on the Baseball America podcast twice each week, along with Teddy Cahill. You can follow him on social media at Joe Healy BA. Joe, welcome back to the podcast. I think other than myself, you have probably been on the Whole Hog Baseball podcast more than any individual. All right. How about that? Good to be back. No, a, a true friend of the program, as they say. That's that's right. Uh, feather, <laughs> feather in your cap. Hey, yeah, so no doubt. You do a great job. I've actually been reading a lot of your conference previews uh, at the Baseball America website this week. And because of, you know, been trying to get a, a feel on these teams that Arkansas is going to play in the non-conference weekend series. So it begins with Illinois State this weekend. Of course, then they go to Round Rock. They play Indiana, Stanford. Louisiana Lafayette, they come back to bomb and they finish off the non-conference part of their schedule with weekend series against Southeastern Louisiana and UIC, the University of Illinois at Chicago. Let's start with Illinois State because that's the team they're going to play this weekend. They come out of the Missouri Valley Conference. And I know the Missouri Valley looks a little bit different now. You know, Wichita State left a few years ago and that kind of changed the complexity of that conference. But that, that's always a league that I think is really good. I mean, uh, Illinois State, they've come in here and they've won some games against Arkansas. Missouri State's a team that, you know, the people who listen to this are very familiar with. Uh, Dallas Baptist comes from that league. Uh, this is a really good conference, and, and you think Illinois State's going to be one of the teams that could potentially contend? Yeah, I think so, and I think you're right on the money with your assessment of the Valley. It's, it's a you know, they, they have lost some teams, Wichita State, Creighton, another one, but uh, they, I think it's seven of that last eight full seasons. They put two teams in a regionals. They put three teams in a regionals before it's, it's a really good league. And it's, it tends to be a, a veteran league. It, the teams that are older tend to win in that league. And Illinois state's kind of in between. They've got some older guys. They've got some younger guys, but yeah, I think, you know, they had a rough year last year. It felt like a, a season last year. I mean, injury, the injury bug bit them a little bit. So the record doesn't look great last year, but that team was more talented than the record would show. And, and a lot of those guys are are back in the fold. Uh, the guy to really watch there is, is Ryan Cermak um, for Illinois state. He's, he's a guy who could play in the sec and, and, and actually play um, really good athlete. He's, he's a six, six runner in the 60 yard dash. He plays center field, won the Missouri Valley conferences defensive player of the year last year. Um, he's got a plus arm. He could play, you know, any outfield position. If he needed to, he could play probably any defensive position except catcher, probably um, best power bat on the team. Uh, they kind of messed around in the fall and put him on the mound. I say messed around. It's, it was not quite that informal, but they put him on the mound on scout day and he was up to 96 off the mound. So he's just, he's a real dude. Um, so that's the guy I can guarantee you this week in, in meetings uh, in the building in Fayetteville, they are talking about how do we make sure we don't let him beat us. Uh, the team can hit just generally though. And that's kind of the case with Illinois state under Steve Holm and, and his assistant Wally Crancer. Those two guys were, involved at Purdue when Mark Wasikowski, who's now at Oregon, uh, was at Purdue and their offenses were always a lot of fun and scored a bunch of runs. And so they're recreating some of that. Now, Jake McCaw is another guy to watch in that lineup for Illinois state. He hit 367 last year. Uh, beyond that, 
Uh, they return a couple of starting pitchers that were really solid for them last year. Jordan Lucier, a kid out of Canada, actually, and then Sean Sinisco. Neither of those guys are guys who miss bats. They, they're really kind of pitchability guys, which, as you and I have talked about before, is, is kind of a rough matchup for them against a team that hits the way Arkansas does and with the way Bob Walker plays at times. So I don't expect too much uh, trouble there necessarily from Arkansas standpoint, but given some of the questions Arkansas itself has on the mound, it could be a weekend where the hogs could end up in a couple of rock fights because I think Illinois state can swing it. Yeah. Dave Van Horn's really been, uh, I think warning fans against, you know, don't expect to sweep because this is a team that has come in and, and won games, you know, right before the 2020 season got shut down, Arkansas had that losing streak where they lost uh, all of their games at the Shriners Classic down in Houston. Then they came back and they lost to Illinois State in the midweek. And Cermak in that game, he went two for five with two RBI. It's, it's a team that doesn't seem like they're going to be intimidated by any kind of, you know, any type of name brand baseball team. That's exactly right. I mean, they pride themselves on having the, you know, any team, any place, anywhere type of mentality. They schedule very aggressively. Uh, just Joe Healy's opinion. Sometimes I think they can kind of schedule themselves into, into a little bit of trouble uh, because they, they are very aggressive. Um, but, you know, it, it worked for them in 2019, 2019, they, they end up getting to a regional because of the quality of the schedule uh, they put together. Now the, the team was talented, too, but you know, you had to make that RPI stuff work for you when you're in a league like the Missouri Valley. So uh, yeah, they're, they are not going to be freaked out by Bob Walker. Um, and as a matter of fact, they're probably going to, to revel in it a little bit and enjoy the experience there. And, and as you know, there, there are some teams that just go into a place like that and, have a lot it takes them a little bit of time to, to adjust to something like that that will not be the case with this team I think probably the hardest thing for teams like Illinois State or UIC who comes in here in a few weeks uh, maybe even to a lesser extent Indiana Indiana's probably got a little bit better facilities than those teams but uh, it's, it's just the weather and trying to get out on the field early in the season you see these teams a lot of times they'll play 13 15 17 games away from home to start the year go on two three week road trips yeah. I mean, it's, it's a way of life in the Midwest. You know, you just, you have to kind of make a, a, uh, you know, a choice t- between two difficult options. One is playing the first at bare minimum three or four weeks on the road or being really aggressive and scheduling a home series in late February and early March, understanding that this thing may not get at all. Um, so there's that there's also just, you never know how much practice these teams have gotten. And I know I've not spoken to, to Steve Fulman, Illinois state or, or uh, coach McDermott at UIC about this specifically leading up to the season. But I know just having folks uh, in my family and friends who look back in the Midwest, that it's been a little bit of a rough, it was a rough late January, early February from a snowfall standpoint in that part of the country. So I don't know how much these teams have been able to get outside necessarily. And so, that, that that can be a real something that really tilts the scales in the direction of the more southern team even though even though i know it's not exactly a, like fayetteville is a tropical paradise this time of year but you allude to the facilities they've obviously got those kinds of advantages so you, you just never know what you're going to get with the team that, that may not have seen a whole lot of sunshine uh this winter yeah we just got six to eight inches of snow a couple of weeks ago so i can imagine what it's like yeah. elsewhere uh illinois state by the way starts with 13 consecutive games away from home uh let's go down next to the week two matchups, and they're going to play three teams in round rock, like I said. Uh, begin with Indiana. This is a team that's always kind of interesting to me. You know, I mean, uh, Chris Lamonis came from there. They've had some other coaches. I think Tracy Smith uh, went from there to Arizona State at one point. It's a program that has always kind of been a contender in the Big Ten. I think last year, weren't they one of the first uh, two or three teams that was left out of the NCAA tournament? I think a lot of people feel like. Uh, what do you feel like Indiana's got coming back this year? Well, it's a really good question because you're you're correct in, in, in your assessment of it. I mean, they're just you can kind of set your watch to Indiana being among the best teams in the Big Ten. And and last year, we'll never know for sure. But had they played a non-conference schedule, I think that Indiana team gets in. You, you, your listeners will probably remember that the Big Ten played just a conference only schedule last year. So it was hard to gauge exactly what you were getting in the Big Ten. But Indiana tends to schedule pretty well. I think they would have picked off a couple of uh good teams early in the season to kind of help out their RPI metrics. I think that's probably a regional team. If they get a full schedule again, we'll never know. They have a lot of turnover though. They had six guys getting drafted at the end of last season, which just speaks to the talent level they have in that program. So there's a lot of question marks there. Um, There is a really high floor for this program, you know, but what I will say is, you know, we've put together our preseason field of 64. We don't have Indiana included this time around. I think, 
you know, Teddy, my colleague does the big 10 preview. I think he pegged them sixth in the conference. Um, I wouldn't put them any lower than that necessarily, but this is not necessarily projected to be the type of Indiana team that's competing to win the big 10. They went pretty heavy in the transfer portal. And because they have the history that they have, I think they're able to attract a certain type of player in the transfer portal. That's ready to help immediately. You know, Bradley Brimmer is a guy who has had a really good career at Wright state that has now moved in uh, to the rotation in Indiana. Tyler Dones, a second baseman from West Virginia, a proven hitter there. Uh, Jack Perkins, a guy at Louisville who is a highly touted um, prospect, you know, runs his fastball into the high nineties, might touch a hundred if he can really gas it up, but struggles with command and never really put it all together at Louisville struggled with some injuries as well. Um, if he gets it right though, he really does kind of change the complexion of this Hoosiers team and, and specific to what Arkansas will have to deal with. One of my concerns with Indiana is having a real guy on Fridays isn't necessarily as important in the Big Ten as it is in the SEC. Depth tends to win in the Big Ten to a greater degree, whereas, as you know, Matt, in the SEC, if, if you don't have a guy who can keep you in Friday games every week, you're, you're just going to have trouble. Um, and the Big Ten's a little different. That said, you'd still like to have that, and we'll have to see if Indiana has that. I think they're going to run John Madunio, uh, one of their more veteran pitchers out there on Fridays, low 90s fastball, touches 95, uh, last year, his slider got whiffs 43% of the time. So he's got some pretty decent stuff. He just hasn't proven it in that type of role. That's one of my concerns with Indiana is I just, I don't know on the front end, like what their, where their high end guys are necessarily this year, unless they hit it big in the transfer portal, which is just such a, a variable. It's hard to, hard to predict what that's going to result in. You mentioned the big 10 didn't play any teams out of conference. I think had they done that, Nebraska would not have been in Fayetteville. Uh, for a regional last year. I think they would have been hosting one in Lincoln. That felt like a super regional when Nebraska came uh, to Fayetteville for that first game. Uh, speaking of super regional type matchups, Arkansas and Stanford in game two in Round Rock, if, if not a College World Series type preview matchup, uh, Stanford top five, top 10 team, depending on the poll in the preseason. Uh, this is a really big matchup, and it's almost a shame that this can't be a three game series. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I had the same thought when I was looking at Arkansas's Stanford schedule. I was like, man, I, that would that would really be a, a fun one because it's two teams that can really swing the bats. They have similar concerns. Um, so it would kind of be an interesting, uh, interesting matchup to see who would kind of be able to problem solve and work things out kind of in real time there. Uh, Stanford can really hit. Uh, the, the name there that your listeners might be familiar with is Brock Jones. Uh, super premium athlete, uh, played on their football team. Uh, has since set that aside to focus on baseball. Seems like that's been a pretty good decision for him. He's a potential first round pick coming up in this uh, coming draft. It's big power. Um, it's good plate discipline. Um, he's not a burner necessarily, uh, but he's a good runner, plays a good center field, fun player to watch, kind of plays with his hair on fire. Um, I always enjoy watching him. So he's probably the guy they're game planning most for, but Drew Bowser was a highly touted recruit coming in uh, to college last year, had a really nice year as a freshman last year. So he's a threat as well. Uh, Tommy Troy is an interesting player. Who's a, a prospect uh, in his own right. He's kind of one of these Swiss army knife guys who could play some third base, some second base, some center field, some left field um, runs really well, has some pop. So it's an interesting lineup. The questions are on the mound and what Stanford's really kind of hoping for is to see steps forward from the pitching staff in the same way that we saw steps forward from the lineup last year. So if you go back to 2020, Stanford was awful in 2020. They were, I think they were five and 11 and it was not a good five and 11 to the extent that you can ever be a good five and 11. They just really looked poor. And it was, it was just a painfully young team and they took lumps. And, and the, I've talked to their coach, Dave Esker about this in the ensuing months. And, and he said, yeah, you know, we knew we were just going to really take it on the chin in 2020. Um, so then you fast forward to 2021 and you're in a position where you don't know what you're going to get. And that lineup just like by leaps and bounds was better last year. Now the flip side of that was that the pitching was young for Stanford last year. And you saw that when they got to Omaha, they just, they just ran short of pitching. They didn't have a lot of guys they trusted. And so now the hope is that that pitching staff, which was oftentimes, you know, they're in their top six or seven pitchers, there were three or four freshmen at any given time. And if those guys are ready to be real, real contributors this year in, in a big way, Stanford's a national title contender. If, if not, they're a pretty similar team to what they were last year, and we saw that got them to Omaha. So uh, that's kind of the floor and ceiling for Stanford. So 
um, you know, that Saturday game uh, is going to be uh, going to be a banger and um, it, it could be a pretty offensive game. I think both teams can, can really swing it. And I'm going to be fascinated to see, you know, how these two teams kind of problem solve on the mound. And if you've forgotten Stanford last year, they were an out away from being in Vanderbilt shoes. They had Vanderbilt down to their last out. Vanderbilt gets off the hook. Otherwise, that's Stanford going to play NC State in the semifinals and potentially getting on through to play Mississippi State in the championship game. That's that's how close they were to having a, a really great season a year ago. Uh, Louisiana Lafayette is going to be the Sunday game in Round Rock. Arkansas fans are going to be real familiar with Matt Deggs, who was a former hitting coach for Dave Van Horn uh, for three years at Arkansas, but not just at Arkansas, also uh, coached with him in, in other stops as well. Uh, this is always a team – that, that seems like they can really slug it, Joe. Yeah. And if, you know, if this team is a true Matt Deggs team, they are going to look to create chaos on offense, because if you go back to, well, you could really look at a couple different things. You can look at the Sam Houston teams that Matt Deggs was, Deggs was the head coach for um, most recently that 2017 Sam Houston team got to a super regional against Florida state. Um, that was a, a team that liked to, to hit and run and bunt for hits and they had some power, but they were really going to just, just keep the pressure on the defense at, at every moment. And when that doesn't go well, it looks really bad because <laughs> it's like, what are we doing here? But when, when it goes well, it really creates chaos. And so I think that's what they're going for. You could also, some of your listeners might be a little more familiar with like the teams at Louis Lafayette in 2014, that te- was a team that hosted a super regional against Ole Miss. Ole Miss ended up coming out of it, but that was an offense that could really bash they had athleticism all over the field. They had guys who could hit the ball out of the park and steal bases. And the numbers, you know, if you go back to look at that 2014 team, and that was not a period of time in college baseball where there was a lot of offense happening. They were kind of the exception to that rule. And so it was a really fun team. It was not fun to play them. Now, this team is not ready to be that team. However, it does feel like the pieces are starting to move in that direction when you look at some of the guys they have on offense, Bobby Lede, Connor Kimple. Max Marshock, a tech, uh, Texas Tech transfer, who uh, is one of the fastest guys in college baseball. The concern when he was at Texas Tech is, you know, you kind of have to get on base to be able to use your speed. And, and that was the piece that was uh, a little bit of a struggle for him. So we'll have to see on that. But he's a on the 20 to 80 scouting scale. He's an 80 runner. Uh, it's that kind of speed. So um, if this team is going to be a, a typical Matt Diggs team, and I think they're in year three there, I, I kind of think they they hope they're getting there at least at this point um that's a team that you know if you're arkansas you you kind of know going into that game we're going to have to weather a little bit of a storm because they're going to throw the kitchen sink at us this is a big game for them it's in a big spot we're playing in this uh you know this minor league stadium this is a, a big game they are going to try to throw everything at them and how teams handle that oftentimes really determines how well you play against a team that wants to win like that Move on to southeastern Louisiana from the Southland Conference. I don't know that a lot of people realize how good the, the baseball is in the Southland Conference. I've had conversations uh, with, with Dave Van Horn about this before. Of course, you know, he came out of the Southland. That was where he had his first uh, Division One head coaching job at Northwestern State. Mike Bianco came out of the Southland. Uh, uh, Wells, the great Alabama coach, he came out of there. There have been some others that have gotten into the SEC and, and in other conferences who have had some success who came out of that league and it seems like Southeastern Louisiana is always kind of like Illinois state. We were talking about with the Missouri Valley. They're always kind of one of those teams that you expect to be in the conversation atop that conference. Yeah, absolutely. And, and now they're, they're set up to be really the class of the Southland because the Southland has undergone a shift. Uh, Lamar, Abilene Christian, Sam Houston, Stephen F. Austin are now in the WAC. And of course, Sam Houston is now moving, also will be headed to Conference USA after that. But uh, Central Arkansas, which is always a pretty solid team there, is now in the A Sun. So it's a smaller league, and the, and the center of power in the Southland really is in the state of Louisiana. And you mentioned some of the great coaches that have come from the league, and that's that is really true. And Northwestern State, in particular, uh, where Coach Van Horn came from, is really kind of an interesting place to look at in terms of being a cradle of coaches. I mean, I'm sure I'll forget someone, but it's, yeah, Jim Wells at Alabama. You mentioned him. It's, it's coach Van Horn. It's uh, Mitch Gaspard, who was the coach at Alabama for a long time. Um, it's like one after the other, after the other coming through that program. Uh, so really impressive stuff there, but with Southeastern Louisiana, they've been a really consistent program there. And like I said, I think they are best positioned to be the team that runs that league, at least as long as that league exists in its current 
iteration. Uh, they too are a team that really kind of likes to make things happen. Um, they have a couple of guys in, in Evan Keller in the lineup and Preston Faulkner in the lineup. I think that are going to make them go. Keller is a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a, a speed guy. I think 19 stolen bases last year. He's going to really try to make things happen. They lost a couple of guys. Tyler Fink was a guy who matriculated out of the program. Uh, they also lost Jacob Burke, a transfer who ended up at Miami, who are also kinds of those catalyst types in the lineup. But Preston Faulkner is kind of your typical. It's a stocky, I think it's 6'1", 230, just a, a real uh, horse of a power hitter. He's going to be the guy in the middle lineup that's going to make them go. But the thing they really hang their hat on is the one-two punch in the rotation. Brennan Stuprich and Will Kinsler or both all conference type pitchers last year. Stuprich's numbers in particular are really, really good. Uh, if they are as, as good as, as they can be, uh, those two guys I think are going to be excellent. So um, again, against a team like Arkansas, that's always the question is, you know, okay, they, they really like those two guys in the front of the rotation, but how well do they throw against a, a lineup as, as good as Arkansas? And that will continue to be the question, but this is another team that is going to show up in Fayetteville and is going to expect to compete and expect to, to, to win games there. And so you're not, there's certainly not going to be a group that's going to roll over. Yeah. Some assistant coaches who've come out of Natchitoches to, to be head coach of some others, uh, Rob Childress, Matt Deggs, uh, Chris Curry, who's the head coach now down in Little Rock. He was a pitching coach at Northwestern state. Pretty, pretty incredible list of coaches. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's a place there. that uh, that's one of those places too, that, you know, I, I did a story in a previous life before I was at BA on, on, Northwestern state producing coaches like that. And, and the guy they've got now, Bobby Barbier, now he's an alum of the program, so he might stick around a little longer, but I think people think pretty highly of him too. Um, but they're one of those places that when you talk to coaches there, I mean, it really is, I don't, I don't mean to be disrespectful about it, but it really is one of those places where they're getting it done there with some chewing gum and bailing wire. Like it's not a program that has a lot of just walking around money. Um, so you're, if you're a head coach there, you're raking the infield and, and you're making, you're, you're handing out the meal money and, and you're doing all those things that you have to do at low level college baseball. And in spite of that, they've been really one of the more successful programs in the Southland for a long, long time. You mentioned some of the conference realignment that's going on. Uh, you know, there's so much focus on what's going on in the SEC with OU and Texas and the teams that are uh, filling their, their spaces in the big 12. Uh, but you know, I, I've kind of paid attention in these, you know, smaller conferences, mid-major, low-major, whatever you want to call them, conferences, uh, there have been a lot of movement in the last 18 to 24 months. And uh, one of the things going on right now, as I'm sure you know, is, is what's going on at UIC, uh, getting ready to move out of the Horizon League. They've been one of the really great baseball programs there. Yeah, you know, Wright State played Tennessee in the, the regional a year ago. UIC, uh, what, what are your evaluations of them? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the second-best program in that conference. And, of course, that's a distant second because Wright State has, has gotten – so good. They, uh, new coach Sean McDermott there. Now he was an assistant uh, previously, so there is continuity there, but Mike D was the name of the coach who stepped away after 23 years there and, and won a lot of games. Uh, they actually have a cool, just as a quick aside, like, um, they do have a, a pretty, now it's not obviously an sec quality thing, but uh, they do have a pretty neat little facility in Chicago for this program. Uh, Curtis Granderson donated, uh, a bunch of money to get this facility up and going. And, and for the size of the program that it is, it's a really nice facility and it's got a cool, you know, if you're sitting in the seats looking out towards the field, it's got a kind of a cool view of the Chicago skyline in the backdrop. So it's one of the, one of the better mid or low major facilities and certainly one of the best backdrops um, of any low major out there. So kind of a, a cool deal for them. And that's been a part of their success is they are able to offer something uh, to these kids who, if, if you're looking at other similar programs, just aren't going to be able to offer that type of facility. So this specific team, it, it tends to be a pitching and defense outfit, but I think this group is probably a little more offensive. Brian Rosario is a kid who hit 400 last year. Josh Figueroa, 351. Cole Kahn hit, hit nine home runs. Uh, Nate Peterson's a transfer from Oklahoma on the mound. Um, he's a guy just given you know, his talent that should break through right away. And, and like I said, this, this does tend to be a pitching and defense type of team. I'm not sure quite what to make of the fact that it looks like it's a little more offensive team. You could read that as, you know, we, we, we will trust that they will get the pitching figured out. And that means this team might actually be pretty doggone good because offense is usually not their calling card, or you could look at it as, you know, this might be the year that they actually don't get it done as much on the mound and that might spell trouble for them. So, um, you know, by this point of the season, uh, hopefully their hope is they will have things a little bit more figured out, more settled on the mound. Um, but the same will be true of, of Arkansas here. But it's, you know, of the teams they're playing in non-conference, I think this is the one that probably 
Uh, certainly it's far from a, a cupcake, if you will. But of the three other series, when we talk Illinois State, Southeastern, and UIC. I think this is the one that um, will be the, the lightest lift, if you will, for the Razorbacks. You know, Arkansas is going to be, they're going to be fine from an RPI standpoint because of all the SEC teams they play. But you look at these 13 games, what do you think that does for them at the end of the year from a, from a postseason standpoint? Yeah, I think it, it doesn't help, doesn't hurt. I mean, obviously, if you, if you lose one of these series or something, that changes the calculus. But if they, you know, if they win as many of these games as they should, um, then I think it, 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 it might help a little if, if, let's say, Stanford is national title contender type of good and Indiana and Louisiana Lafayette look like at-large teams, uh, that might be able to, to, to be a little bit of a help, if you will. But I certainly don't think it's going to hurt because Illinois State, even if they're not, even if they're not an at-large contender, I think is probably a top 100 RPI team. Indiana is certainly a top 100 RPI team. Stanford and Louisiana Lafayette are in that same range. You know, UIC, because of the conference they play in, might be a little bit of an RPI anchor. They might be 200 plus in the RPI, um, but Southeastern is probably top 150, 125. So you add all that together. And, and as you know, you know, messing with the RPI is, is sometimes less about what high end wins do you have? Although in the SEC, Arkansas will have plenty of those and more about what bad RPI losses do you avoid? Um, and I think they'll be fine from that standpoint. Like I said, I th- UIC is the only team that is a little risky in terms of being a high RPI team, but every team in America has games against teams like that. I mean, we see it in the SEC with uh, teams that play teams from the SWAC or the lower end teams from the Southland or, or what have you. Uh, these games just happen. They're unavoidable. And it's one of the reasons why, frankly, I've always been an advocate of, I would like to see something in the RPI where we chop off the, like the, the lowest three or five or six RPI games on the conference, because it, what you end up doing is you're disincentivizing programs from scheduling lower end teams and those teams have to make a schedule too right so if those coaches are sitting in a situation where no one wants to play them because they know what it's going to do to their rpi and it just feels like a little bit unfair for all all parties involved right the lower end team can't get a schedule done the high end team is is scared of dropping that game and if they do drop that game it could wreck their postseason chances so i'd like to see something remedied there i'm not smart enough to really be able to give you a a big uh, sweeping change to the RPI that would, that would be a game changer for baseball. But, but I would like to see some sort of amnesty for some of these lower end RPI games, just to make it a little more fair for everybody. Well, and you also get into a situation late in the year where it gets difficult to schedule games because, you know, say like Illinois state, they've got to get some home games in at the end of the year, you know, to make up for the ones they didn't get early in the season, but even like Arkansas, you know, they've got to play, uh, say Arkansas Pine Bluff they play them two times a year most of the most of the time and uh, you know that's a game that you kind of have but Pine Bluff's not a real good RPI team and you know could potentially pull it down I, I understand what you're saying I think there's a lot of nuances to scheduling before we get you out of here just real quick uh, what, what's your what's your take on Arkansas yeah I mean obviously floor really really high ceiling really really high the the Paulette injury is obviously just a gut punch because his talent was to the point where, Hey, you know, this could be, this could be a real dude for us on Fridays and change the complexion of this team a little bit. I have faith in the talent on the mound. Um, but as, as you and your listeners know all too well, like it's just a matter of piecing all that together. And and we saw last year where the individual talent was, was excellent. Um, but when it came right down to it, uh, you know, the, the pitching staffs get shorter and shorter and shorter as the season goes on. And, um, the goal is to try to, to, lessen that as, 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 as things happen in, in to where you have six, seven, eight guys you trust as opposed to three, four, or five, ultimately. So that's going to be the big question over the course of the entire season. Big picture though, I, I've kind of been throwing around this, uh, working through this, this, this working theory I have about the SEC. Um, and I'll, I'll throw it out here because you, you, this is, this is good for you and your listeners to, to kind of think about too. And, and I'm curious your thoughts on it, but I feel a little like, in SEC baseball and then by and large college baseball in general, because the SEC is the best conference is, is moving a little in direction of football where take, for example, Alabama football this past fall, where we all looked at it going into the season and said, you know, like this is obviously a great Alabama team, but it might be a step back from what Alabama usually is. Right. And that kind of came true because they, they toyed around with some teams and they lost that game day and M and yet that was still a team that got to the national title game even though we knew on paper Georgia was, was having the better season. And 
I've thought about that with regards to baseball, because I think the expectations for what a step back season are, especially in the sec on the high end are changing a little bit. And I look at this year's preseason rankings and you've got Vanderbilt right there. You've got Mississippi state right there and you've got Arkansas right there. And we had full disclosure, we had Arkansas higher in the rankings. We got, had the, the fortune, I guess, um, of, having the Paulette injury happen before we released the rankings. So we were able to adjust, but we had them higher initially, but you've got those three teams that at this point just kind of come into every season expected to be right there. And that used to happen a lot less in college baseball. It used to be, if you were a program like Vanderbilt, where you lose Jack Leiter and, and Kamar rocker. And in previous years, they lose a JJ Blade in the lineup and, and whoever else, Austin Martin, and the next year you'd go, okay, it's a little bit of a retooling year and the sec is good. So maybe this is more of a, a team that's a bubble host or a two seed and Mississippi state. If you look at Mississippi state's history, you know, not, not that long ago, let's say 10 years ago, they were not a team that was immune from having a year where they would toy with missing the sec tournament. Mm -hmm. Arkansas has had those years too. And I kind of suspect those years just aren't going to happen anymore. And I could be wrong. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not a soothsayer here, but with the way, the sport is moving and with the way these programs are recruiting now and getting more and more guys who could have been drafted, who could have gone into pro ball more and more of those kids, especially as the draft shrinks are choosing college baseball. And I, I do wonder if the upshot of that is going to be these really, really high end programs that are operating at the very tip top of the sport just aren't going to have steps back in a traditional sense anymore. Yeah. I think you might be right. You know, a couple of things that, that come to mind as you were talking about that is that, you know, the, the transfer rules have really made it to where I think that they can reload a lot quicker than they used to be able to, uh, whether it be through graduate transfers, transfers from other schools, there's so much more freedom of movement than there used to be. You know, the other thing that stands out to me is just the amount of money that the, the SEC teams put into baseball. And I'm not just talking about for facilities. I'm talking about, you know, the money that they offered their head coaches and their assistant coaches. I mean, you saw Sloss Nagel and Johnson jump to the league this year. Uh, you know, even their volunteer coaches, volunteer coaches technically are not paid, but everybody gets creative with ways to get their volunteer coaches money. And so I think you're getting a lot more elite level of a volunteer coach coming into the league. And so I think you're right. And there's also the expectations, you know, with, with more money, you know, with higher ticket prices, like you're about to have here at Arkansas, or you, or you do have this year in terms of uh, donations that are, are being required to get tickets. Uh, you know, there's just so much more expectations to be good from year to year. And I think you're right. It's getting to be almost like SEC football, not quite at that level, but it's getting to be, you know, more like that because, you know, the more, you ask from people, the more that's expected. And so I I think you might be onto something there. I mean, it's, it seems like there's about six programs in the sec that you expect to be right there at the end of the year. And even in LSU, like last year, they had a down year, but all of a sudden there, they are playing Tennessee in the super regional two wins away from going to Omaha. It just seems like there's probably eight or nine teams that could be in that boat in the league. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. I think all you, all you said there is right. I think it's sometimes we, we look, the money piece is interesting to me too, because you're right in that we, we hear money and we tend to think facilities and that, because that's what we can see with our eyes. Right. Um, but I think you're right that there are a lot of other things under the surface that that buddy goes toward. And I, I have to wonder if it, this, this is not new, right? Arkansas has been spending money on baseball, Mississippi state, whoever else, LSU been spending money on baseball forever, but you just wonder if maybe the tail was a little longer on it where it took a little time for that to really be expressed in the results in the field in terms of the way these teams are, are operating. So, you know, I'll be fascinated by it. You know, I, I don't think there will be a lot of hand wringing about that uh, if, if this comes to fruition, but I, I don't know. Um, I, I tend to be a believer in the high tide rising all boats. I mean, you see it with uh, Kentucky built a brand new stadium, you know, and Kentucky baseball is, as your listeners know, is, is one of those programs that just uh, year to year is not going to compete at the top of the sec. And that's just the reality, but they're out here building a, a new stadium. So that high tide does rise all boats and it, the, in the immediate term, it might mean that there's a little bit of, of difference between those that are really the haves and the have nots, not just in the SEC, but nationally. But I'd like to believe that what it ends up doing is is raising the profile of college baseball as a whole. And, and ultimately, I think that's what we're all hoping for. And the SEC is about to get better because Texas comes in in four years. Correct. The uh, consensus Correct. number one this year. Yes. This is pretty yeah. crazy. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it'll, be, no it'll be part of the SEC. Come, come see what it's about. Hey, Joe, we appreciate yeah. your time. Absolutely, Matt. Happy to do it. Joe Healy of Baseball America. That's it for us on the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast. 
be back next week to look back at the Illinois State Series, also to look ahead at the Razorbacks games in Round Rock. Until then, visit us at wholehogsports.com. We'll have plenty of coverage leading up to, during, and after the games against Illinois State this weekend, including during the games. We have live updates and analysis on our site. Also, hope you'll catch the basketball podcast of Mid-America on our podcast network. This week, Scotty Bordelon, Bob Holt, and I look back at the Razorbacks games against Alabama and Missouri and ahead to this weekend's top 25 matchup with Tennessee. You can find all of our podcasts by searching Whole Hog Radio on most podcast suppliers. That's W-H-O-L-E-H-O-G-R-A-D-I-O, three words, Whole Hog Radio. Our basketball and baseball podcasts are in full swing. For Bubba Carpenter, I'm Matt Jones. We appreciate you joining us, and we'll see you again next week on the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast. The proceeding has been a production of WholeHogSports.com. Look for our latest podcasts on Apple, Spotify, or your favorite podcast store. And visit us anytime at WholeHogSports.com for the latest news and commentary.